Hello, my Adventist brothers and sisters. My name is Mike, and like many of you, I have been following the controversy over women's ordination within our church. I feel like most of what can be said on the subject has already been said, and I have no desire to be redundant. However, as a student of Bible prophecy, I believe the current women's ordination crisis we are facing has been foretold in the scriptures. As Seventh-day Adventists, we are familiar with Jesus' movements through the heavenly sanctuary. We know that in 1844, Jesus entered into the most holy place, signifying that we are living in the antitypical Day of Atonement. This means the objects inside the most holy place, such as the Ten Commandments inside the Ark of the Covenant, represent present truth, including Aaron's rod. The Bible tells us what Aaron's rod was to represent. And the Lord said unto Moses, Bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony, to be kept for a token against the rebels. Aaron's rod was to be a token or a sign against those who were in rebellion. Rebellion against what? Against the priesthood. This means that sometime after 1844, when Jesus entered into the most holy place, God's people would pass through another rebellion against the priesthood, another rebellion of Korah. Korah was the cousin of Moses and a leader in this rebellion. In Patriarchs and Prophets, we read, Though appointed to the service of the tabernacle, he had become dissatisfied with his position and aspired to the dignity of the priesthood. Moses then said to Korah and those gathered with him, Seemeth it but a small thing unto you that the God of Israel hath separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them? And he hath brought thee near to him, and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee, and seek ye the priesthood also? In other words, Moses was astonished that although chosen by God to serve a special purpose and minister to the congregation, they were still dissatisfied and desired to fill a position God had not ordained them to fill. Picture the scene here. Korah and his followers and all the sons of Levi are gathered against Moses as he speaks to them. But scripture does not say they are gathered against Moses. Moses said in verse 11, Both thou and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord. By rebelling against those ordained by God, they were rebelling against God. You see, at the heart of the matter, this was an issue of authority. By whose authority had Moses and Aaron obtained the priesthood? Was it by God's authority or by man's authority? Korah and those in rebellion believed Moses and Aaron were self-appointed by their own authority. Look at verse 13. Among the other rebels were Dathan and Abiram, and they said to Moses, Thou make thyself altogether a prince over us. In accusing Moses and Aaron of appointing themselves, the rebels had in one statement both denied the authority of God and assumed it for themselves. Patriarchs and Prophets leaves us with a multitude of inspired insight, including this statement. Speaking of the rebels, we read, they had discussed the question of the right of Moses to so great authority and honor until they had come to regard him as occupying a very enviable position which any of them could fill as well as he. And they deceived themselves and one another into thinking that Moses and Aaron had themselves assumed the positions they held. The discontented ones said that these leaders had exalted themselves above the congregation of the Lord in taking upon them the priesthood and government but their house was not entitled to distinction above others in Israel. They were no more holy than the people, and it should be enough for them to be on a level with their brethren who were equally favored with God's special presence and protection. Brothers and sisters, is the experience of Aaron's rod in the test over the priesthood not to be repeated at the end of time? And if it is, how significant is this crisis over the priesthood in our church? For it is a sure evidence that we, like the Israelites, are on the borders of Canaan, Let's take a closer look at this rebellion, and as we do, I think you will see the arguments and positions playing out in the rebellion of Korah are being repeated today in the crisis over women's ordination. Back in Numbers chapter 16, God had said to his people in verse 26, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest ye be consumed in all their sins. God took this rebellion against his authority so seriously it warranted a penalty of death. And Moses pronounces the sentence, and in so doing, defends the authority by which he was ordained to the priesthood. He said to the rebels, Hereby ye shall know that the Lord hath sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of my own mind. And to prove his authority was given of God, and that he was not self-appointed, 
Moses pronounces the sign by which they should know the authority he was given was by God. He said to them, If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth, and swallow them up with all that appertain unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, then ye shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. And it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and their houses, and all the men that appertained unto Korah, and all their goods. They and all that appertained unto them went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. The sign had come to pass, and by a miracle all the congregation of Israel was made to understand that in seeking the priesthood the rebels had provoked the Lord. You would think this would settle the issue of the priesthood, but it didn't. The very next day the rebellion continued. But on the morrow all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, Ye have killed the people of the Lord. It's hard to imagine after the ground opened up and swallowed the rebels, the people would blame the event on Moses. But do you see what the people had done? Not once, but twice they had denied God. They denied the authority of God in denying the ordination of Moses to the priesthood. And they had denied the power of God in the display that was to be a sign of his authority. This was a repetition of the story of Cain and Abel. One party wanted to acknowledge and follow what God had required, while the other party wanted to do things their own way. Now a second time, the penalty of rebellion weighed upon the people, and a plague began to consume them. So watch what happens next. Moses said to Aaron, Take a censer and put fire therein from off the altar, and put on incense, and go quickly unto the congregation and make an atonement for them. For there is wrath gone out from the Lord, the plague is begun. And Aaron took as Moses commanded, and ran into the midst of the congregation, and behold, the plague was begun among the people. And he put on incense and made an atonement for the people, and he stood between the dead and the living, and the plague was stayed. How did Moses and Aaron stop the plague? By exercising their divine authority as priests. The very act of atoning for the sins of the people and stopping the plague should have been unmistakable evidence that their authority as ordained priests was from the Lord. Furthermore, the people should have been grateful for their intercession. But one last sign was to finally settle the question forever, Aaron's rod. God said to Moses, Speak unto the children of Israel, and take of every one of them a rod according to the house of their fathers, of all their princes according to the house of their fathers, twelve rods. Write thou every man's name upon his rod, and thou shalt write Aaron's name upon the rod of Levi, for one rod shall be for the head of the house of their fathers. And thou shalt lay them up in the tabernacle of the congregation before the testimony where I will meet with you. And it shall come to pass that the man's rod whom I shall choose shall blossom, and I will make to cease from me the murmurings of the children of Israel, whereby they murmur against you. So every one of the princes of Israel, twelve altogether, was given a rod. They wrote their names on their rod and brought them before the sanctuary, awaiting the miraculous sign. And we read in Numbers 17, 8, And it came to pass that on the morrow Moses went into the tabernacle of witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded, and brought forth buds and bloomed blossoms, and yielded almonds. And so it was, the question of the priesthood was settled by the miraculous budding of blossoms and almonds on Aaron's rod. And so it was written, and the Lord said unto Moses, Bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony to be kept for a token against the rebels, and thou shalt quite take away their murmurings from me, that they die not. Why did God instruct Moses to store Aaron's rod in the Ark of the Testimony, or the Ark of the Covenant? There is only one reason given. It was to be kept for a token against the rebels. Not only those of that generation, but for all future generations, including ours. It was a token or a sign for us that the authority of the priesthood was of divine origin and that only those whom God had ordained for the priesthood shall fulfill that role. How applicable then is the significance of Aaron's rod for us as our church faces this crisis? Ellen White also says about Aaron's budded rod, It was shown to the people and afterward laid up in the tabernacle as a witness to succeeding generations. This miracle effectually settled the question of the priesthood. It was now fully established that Moses and Aaron had spoken by divine authority, and the people were compelled to believe the unwelcome truth that they were to die in the wilderness. It was the miracle of Aaron's rod that led them to finally confess their error. They confessed that they had sinned in rebelling against their leaders, 
and that Korah and his company had suffered from the just judgment of God. Brothers and sisters, will this ancient miracle settle the question of the priesthood for us? Aaron's rod was assigned to them, and it is assigned to us that the authority and roles of the priesthood were established by God and not by man. And being established by God, how can man claim to change it without presuming the authority of God? The prophet's pen has written the following for our admonition. Miriam and Aaron had never known the weight of care and responsibility which had rested upon Moses, yet because they had been chosen to aid him, they regarded themselves as sharing equally with him the burden of leadership. We're told, Miriam and Aaron, blinded by jealousy and ambition, said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? Regarding themselves as equally favored by God, they felt that they were entitled to the same position and authority. Korah and his company had made the same assessment, and though they had received the wrath of God, they said that the congregation were not at fault, since they desired nothing more than their rights. I hear those in favor of the ordination of women repeating the sentiments of Miriam and Korah, saying they desire nothing more than their equal rights. So eerily, these exact same words from the first woman who sought the priesthood now ring from the lips of those proposing the ordination of women. So what did God do? The Lord then called Aaron and Miriam before him. After God spoke with them, we read, The anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. So what then became of the only woman in the scriptures to seek the priesthood? The Bible says, Behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. Those advocating women's ordination often endeavor, like the world, to confuse and blend the difference between men and women, saying we are all the same. They say the Bible is not clear on the subject of ordination and therefore we should leave it up to the people. While our prophet has explicitly said, the scriptures are plain upon the relations and rights of men and women. Undoubtedly, men and women are of equal value in the eyes of God, but clearly men and women are different physically and they are different emotionally. They solve problems differently, think differently, and this is because we are created and designed to fulfill different roles. So just what is the role of a woman? Woman should fill the position which God originally designed for her as her husband's equal. The world needs mothers, who are mothers not merely in name, but in every sense of the word. We may safely say that the distinctive duties of women are more sacred, more holy than those of man. Did you catch that? The distinctive duties of a woman are more sacred, more holy than those of man? If this is true, then a woman seeking the priesthood must be seeking a lower position than that for which she was created, would she not? Ella White continues, Let woman realize the sacredness of her work and in the strength and fear of God take up her life mission. And just what is her life mission that is more sacred than the duties of a man? It is in the following words, Let her educate her children for usefulness in this world and for a home in the better world. She should feel that she is her husband's equal, to stand by his side, she faithful at her post of duty, and he at his. Her work in the education of her children is in every respect as elevating and ennobling as any post of duty he may be called to fill, even if he is to be the chief magistrate of the nation. Again, we are told in Christian Temperance and Bible Hygiene, the position of a woman in her family is more sacred than that of the king upon his throne. Unmistakably, there is a difference in the duties and roles that men and women have been designed by God to fulfill, and the highest calling we can each have is to fulfill the purpose for which we have been created. If a woman were to assume the role of a man, or a man the role of a woman, both would fall far below their heavenly purpose. The king upon his throne has no higher work than has the mother. The mother is the queen of her household. She has in her power the molding of her children's characters, that they may be fitted for the higher immortal life. An angel could not ask for a higher mission, for in doing this work she is doing service for God. Let her only realize the high character of her task, and it will inspire her with courage. Let her realize the worth of her work and put on the whole armor of God that she may resist the temptation to conform to the world's standard. Her work is for time and for eternity. I think it is safe to say few women have ever contemplated the true significance of their high calling. If more women correctly understood the sacredness of their duties, perhaps the temptation to conform to the world's standard and seeking other positions of influence would not be a temptation. The influence of the mother upon her children and through her children upon the world will reach into eternity. The husband in the open missionary field may receive the honors of men, while the home toiler may receive no earthly credit for her labor. 
But if she works for the best interest of her family, seeking to fashion their characters after the divine model, the recording angel writes her name as one of the greatest missionaries in the world. God does not see things as man's finite vision views them. Ladies, please never fail to view your position and purpose through the eyes of God instead of the eyes of the world. And there needs to be no confusion concerning God's view of the roles of men and women because we are told exactly how He views them. And this is an amazing statement. Could the veil be withdrawn and the father and mother see as God sees the work of the day and see how His infinite eye compares the work of the one with that of the other, they would be astonished at the heavenly revelation. The father would view his labors in a more modest light, while the mother would have new courage and energy to pursue her labor with wisdom, perseverance, and patience. Now she knows its value. While the father has been dealing with the things which must perish and pass away, the mother has been dealing with developing minds and character, working not only for time, but for eternity. Ladies, your duty to God is viewed by heaven with such sacredness and holiness that not even angels could ask for a higher mission. So make no mistake, to seek the priesthood is to sacrifice your God-given womanhood and the sacredness of your high calling for a lower position than that to which you have been called. Remember, Satan professed to be seeking to promote the stability of the divine government while secretly bending every effort to secure its overthrow. And even now, he inspires women in the same way with his claim of equal rights, leading them to think they will gain and maintain their dignity and womanhood when in the eyes of heaven they will lose it, just as Eve did. Eve had been perfectly happy by her husband's side in her Eden home, but like restless modern Eves, she was flattered with the hope of entering a higher sphere than that which God had assigned her. In attempting to rise above her original position, she fell far below it. A similar result will be reached by all who are unwilling to take up cheerfully their life duties in accordance with God's plan. In their efforts to reach positions for which He has not fitted them, many are leaving vacant the place where they might be a blessing. And here is why I said what I did, that in their desire for a higher sphere, many have sacrificed true womanly dignity and nobility of character and have left undone the very work that heaven appointed them. It is true a mother's work is never done and is often unappreciated or as unrecognized as it should be. But every faithful mother will be well rewarded in the courts of heaven. In the book Child Guidance, Ellen White describes this reward. We see a retinue of angels on either side of the gate, and as we pass in, Jesus speaks, Come ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom that is prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Here he tells you to be a partaker of his joy, and what is that? It is the joy of seeing the travail of your soul, fathers. It is the joy of seeing that your efforts, mothers, are rewarded. Here are your children. The crown of life is upon their heads. And the angels of God immortalize the names of the mothers whose efforts have won their children to Jesus Christ. Ladies, never let the devil deceive you into sacrificing the dignity and nobility of heaven's high calling for you for something like the priesthood. If more women correctly understood the purpose of their creation and the role they have been ordained of God to fulfill, there would be fewer women seeking the ordination of the priesthood. But this crisis over women's ordination does not lay entirely at the feet of the woman. Men are also to blame. Do you know what is missing from the world the most? The greatest want of the world is the want of men. Men who will not be bought or sold, men who in their inmost souls are true and honest, men who do not fear to call sin by its right name, men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole, men who will stand for the right though the heavens fall. Men, it is time we fulfill our God-appointed duty to stand up for truth and righteousness. Too often men have sacrificed their dignity and duty and nobility of character to please the people and earn their approbation. Paul said in Galatians 1.10, Do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. There are far too many men appointed positions of leadership in the church that are like Aaron, afraid of the people desiring their affirmation more than their salvation. As a result, the claim is made that many women could speak and stand for truth more boldly than those currently employed in our pulpits. And in this, I'd have to say they are correct. Many women could perform the duties of a pastor better than many men, but this does not mean that women should fill these positions. It means the men in those positions must step up to the plate or step off, and this is what the prophet instructs us. 
The converting power of God must come upon the hearts of the ministers or they should seek some other calling. We are very blessed to have a few good men lifting up the standard, but more are needed. If we had more men in our church that were converted and convicted, who understood their duties and roles and, in the fear of God, were proclaimers and defenders of undiluted truth, they would garner more respect from the men and women they are shepherding. And seeing the position of ordained minister filled by a man set on fire by the Spirit of God, the people would respect the leadership of that man, and ordaining women to the priesthood would not even come to mind, because there would be no need. But today there is a need for spirit-filled leaders, and therefore the greatest want of the world is the want of men. And while these men are vacant, our people will be tempted to fill this vacancy another way. I believe the story regarding Aaron's rod is not just a record of a past event in ancient Israel, but given that it was placed in the Ark of the Covenant in the Most Holy Place, the rod itself is also a prophecy foretelling that spiritual Israel will face another rebellion sometime after 1844 in the prophetic Day of Atonement, and that is us, and that is now. The Day of Atonement was the Day of Judgment, and on this day God's people were separated. Those who had brought their sins into the sanctuary were forgiven, while those who clung to their sins were cut off from among Israel. Also, in the days of Korah, there was a separation among God's people. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. This is unmistakably the second angel's message. It is a call to separate those indulging in sinful practices before the judgments of God fall upon them. Just as we read in Revelation, when the second angel says, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. According to the scriptures, those in Babylon are practicing sin, and when we look to modern Babylon, what do we see is happening? In 1956, the Methodist Church approved full clergy rights for women. The Presbyterian USA Church followed in 1959. The Episcopal Church decided to ordain women in 1976. The Catholic Church is, as of recently, ordaining women, even if it's against official church policy, although many within the church are still calling for women priests in order to survive, they say. The Christian Reformed Church in North America began ordaining women in 1995. Between 2005 and 2014, the Anglican Church went through a conflict over women's ordination, finally approving it last November in 2014, after 500 years of male headship. They ordained their first female bishop in January of this year, and five months later, in June, she was back in the news expressing her desire that the church should refer to God as a she. The Mormon Church has not allowed women to be ordained, but last year in April, 400 women marched together to the Temple Square in Salt Lake City to protest, showing the fight is far from over. It seems there is no denomination that has not already allowed the ordination of women in which this controversy is not stirring. As Seventh-day Adventists, we know the Bible calls these Christian denominations Babylon, and in Babylon, the spirit to ordain women to the priesthood is on the move. So, if the ordination of women is the moving of the Holy Spirit, as some say, then we must confess that it is the Spirit of God moving in unprecedented ways in the Catholic and Protestant, Mormon, and other churches. However, the Bible says this is not the case. We read, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. According to the Bible, the spirit working in these churches is not the Holy Spirit, but a foul spirit, and the working of demons. And if it is a foul spirit that is motivating this push for the ordination of women in Babylon, then it is a foul spirit that is pushing for the ordination of women among us. This crisis over women's ordination is much, much more significant than many realize, because what is actually playing out right now is a conflict between all the same principles that split the church in heaven. We can say this about women's ordination because this is what we've been told about the Rebellion of Korah. In the Rebellion of Korah is seen the working out upon a narrower stage of the same spirit that led to the rebellion of Satan in heaven. It was pride and ambition that prompted Lucifer to complain of the government of God and to seek the overthrow of the order which had been established in heaven. Since the fall, it has been his object to infuse the same spirit of envy and discontent, the same ambition for position and honor into the minds of men. He thus worked upon the minds of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram to arouse the desire for self-exaltation and excite envy, distrust, and rebellion. Notice in particular this next statement. We're told Satan caused them to reject God as their leader by rejecting the men of God's appointment. And the same thing is happening right now. 
Yet while in their murmuring against Moses and Aaron, they blasphemed God. They were so deluded as to think themselves righteous and to regard those who had faithfully reproved their sins as actuated by Satan. Since the rebellion of Korah was a working out upon a narrower stage of the great controversy between Christ and Satan, then so is the women's ordination crisis. And if in the rebellion of Korah it was sin and blasphemy to murmur against and reject the men of God's appointment, it must also be true today as well. We are all looking so closely for the coming Sunday laws and the last battle between Christ and Satan over the law of God that we do not recognize the same conflict being played out in the present crisis. In 1990, the worldwide Seventh-day Adventist Church voted no regarding women's ordination. As if the question was not settled, it was again brought to the GC in 1995, and again the vote was no. Now here we are in 2015, and the issue is to be voted on for the third time. How many times does the World Church need to vote on this before the result is upheld? It is the Church's official policy not to ordain women as pastors, but already, before the third vote has taken place, SDA churches have already ordained female pastors in outright rebellion against the Church, showing no regard for its policies or the people who have already voted on this issue twice. If that were not bad enough, in the book Reflections on Women's Ordination, we read, Ignoring recent General Conference appeals to refrain from acting independently, the Columbia Union on July 29, 2012, voted overwhelmingly to authorize the ordination without regard to gender. This was done in the very presence of Elder Ted N.C. Wilson, General Conference President, who appealed to the delegates to drop the motion. What is happening right now is another rebellion of Korah. The Prophet of God has warned us the evils from the rebellion of Korah exist today. She wrote, do not the same evils still exist that lay at the foundation of Korah's ruin? Pride and ambition are widespread, and when these are cherished, they open the door to envy and a striving for supremacy. The soul is alienated from God and unconsciously drawn into the ranks of Satan. Like Korah and his companions, many, even of the professed followers of Christ, are thinking, planning, and working so eagerly for self-exaltation that in order to gain the sympathy and support of the people, they are ready to pervert the truth falsifying and misrepresenting the Lord's servants. Just as with Lucifer in the great controversy, it was a selfish spirit that fueled Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and others in striving for the supremacy in seeking the priesthood. And in turn, this led to an unconscious separation of the soul from God and their rebellion against the Lord and his representatives. We read in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 42, about Lucifer. He had sought to falsify the word of God and had misrepresented his plan of government, claiming that God was not just in imposing laws upon the angels, that in requiring submission and obedience from his creatures, he was seeking merely the exaltation of himself. The devil's argument was that God had selfishly required the submission of his creatures and the exaltation of himself. And with that in mind, do you remember what Korah said about Moses? But many were not ready to accept Korah's accusations against Moses. The memory of his patient, self-sacrificing labors came up before them, and conscience was disturbed. It was therefore necessary to assign some selfish motive for his deep interest for Israel. And the old charge was reiterated, that he had led them out to perish in the wilderness that he might seize upon their possessions. The devil's strategy in heaven was to accuse God of selfish motives, and he imbues those influenced by him with the same spirit. In the rebellion in heaven and the rebellion of Korah, the exact same accusations were made that are now being made against those who oppose the ordination of women. It is said that in opposing women's ordination, they are selfishly denying women their rights. Can you now see that this crisis is not merely about church policy, but about the preparedness and fitness of God's people to fulfill their role in the finishing of the great controversy? Irregardless of what happens at the GC session in July, I believe this crisis is far from over. Many who are wholeheartedly willing to submit to God's government are still deceived, and I believe for this reason God will allow this crisis to mature further, because this is how God has handled the great controversy in heaven. Satan had made it appear that he himself was seeking to promote the good of the universe. The true character of the usurper and his real object must be understood by all. He must have time to manifest himself by his wicked works. What will happen in the wake of the GC, I do not know, but Ellen White's statement in Second Selected Messages, page 113, rings with relevance. She says, A new life is coming from heaven and taking possession of all God's people, but divisions will come in the church. Two parties will be developed. The wheat and the tares grow up together for the harvest. 
Not only are we told two parties will be developed, but we are told how. God will arouse his people. If other means fail, heresies will come in among them, which will sift them, separating the chaff from the wheat. Is women's ordination a heresy that God has allowed in the church to wake up his people? Will this crisis further develop in a separation of two parties within our church? Time will tell. Timothy says, For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Timothy is pointing out the order in the home is an example of the order in the church. The man is to be the priest of the household, selflessly caring, protecting, and providing for his family. In a household with two women, one of those women takes on the role of the man, and you have a homosexual relationship. So what happens if a woman takes on the role of a man in the church? Is it not a form of spiritual homosexuality within the church? And if homosexuality gains a foothold in the church spiritually, what's to stop it from gaining a foothold in the church physically and literally, and thus ordaining gay and lesbian pastors? You know, just recently, the Supreme Court decided that gay marriage should be legal in all 50 states. And as Christians, we think, what right does man have to redefine the institution given by God? So why do Christians not see the ordination of the priesthood in the same light? What right does man have to redefine the priesthood which was instituted and ordained by God? You know, something interesting happened in the scriptures when the disciples were debating amongst themselves who would be the greatest. And then Jesus came among them and asked about this. And he came to Capernaum, and being in the house, he asked them, What was it that ye disputed among yourselves by the way? But they held their peace, for by the way they had disputed among themselves who should be the greatest. We're told in the Desire of Ages, the presence of Jesus and his question put the matter in an entirely different light from that which it had appeared to them while they were contending by the way. Shame and self-condemnation kept them silent. Jesus had told them that he was to die for their sake, and their selfish ambition was in painful contrast to his unselfish love. If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. There was in these words a solemnity and impressiveness which the disciples were far from comprehending. That which Christ discerned they could not see. They did not understand the nature of Christ's kingdom, and this ignorance was the apparent cause of their contention. The very thing that led to the striving for the supremacy amidst the disciples was that they did not understand the nature of God's kingdom is selflessness. If there was ever an injustice in the world, it would be the crucifixion of the most selfless being to have ever have walked the earth. And what did Jesus say when he was brought to his trial? But Jesus yet answered nothing. If there is ever a striving for supremacy amongst the members of our church, be it for the position of an elder, a cook, a Sabbath school teacher, or a pastor, that spirit is not the spirit of Christ. In the Desire of Ages, we read about Lucifer. He sought for himself the highest place, and every being who is actuated by his spirit will do the same. Thus, alienation, discord, and strife will be inevitable. Dominion becomes the prize of the strongest. The kingdom of Satan is a kingdom of force. Every individual regards every other as an obstacle in the way of his own advancement or a stepping stone on which he himself may climb to a higher place. In contrast to the spirit of self-seeking and self-exaltation, it was Christ who made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now the cross was just before him, and his own disciples were so filled with self-seeking, the very principle of Satan's kingdom, that they could not enter into sympathy with their Lord or even understand him as he spoke of his humiliation for them. Very tenderly, yet with solemn emphasis, Jesus tried to correct the evil. He showed what is the principle that bears sway in the kingdom of heaven, and in what true greatness consists, as estimated by the standard of the courts above. Those who were actuated by pride and love of distinction were thinking of themselves and of the rewards they were to have, rather than how they were to render back to God the gifts they had received. They would have no place in the kingdom of heaven, for they were identified with the ranks of Satan. Brothers and sisters, we are living in the Day of Atonement, and those items placed in the Ark of the Covenant in ancient times represent truths and tests for God's people at the end of time. Aaron's rod was placed in the Ark of the Covenant to be kept for a token against the rebels, and thou shalt quite take away their murmurings from me, that they die not. Aaron's budded rod is a sign from which all succeeding generations must learn from the mistakes of Korah and his rebels. 
And I believe when God worked a miracle and caused Aaron's rod to bud and bring forth almonds, that he was also thinking about us. Aaron's rod is present truth. It is a present test, and the real question before us is not so much about the ordination of women as it is about the selfless or selfish order of our own hearts. And on this point, we all must cast a vote. Remember, Aaron's rod is a prophecy and a warning for our church, who, living in the Day of Atonement, is facing another rebellion over the matter of the priesthood. We must be so filled with Christ and His selfless love that there may be no room left for self to gain a foothold. We are on the fringes of eternity, a world of precious souls laid just beyond our borders, perishing for want of hope and a knowledge of God. More now than ever in the history of humanity, we must put away self. The prophet has warned us, we have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. We focus so much on the law of God inside the Ark of the Covenant, will we also neglect Aaron's rod that was also placed inside the Ark for our generation? And if there be any doubt, let me leave you with this last question posed by Ellen White. The history of the rebellion of Dathan and Abiram is being repeated and will be repeated till the close of time. Who will be on the Lord's side? Who will be deceived and in their turn become deceivers?